all blessing flow to our pastor in his absence, to our to a Zion elder, Brother White, to you, the congregation. It's good to be here, amen? amen. I'm here to, to bring you on our special day that's coming up, which is our pastor anniversary of recognizing him for all the great things he had done and, and recognizing him for just being a man who you know, doing God work sometimes is not easy. You know, I had a chance to just shout him for a couple of weeks and things he do behind the scenes, it just, you would, you would be surprised. We asked you to come out and join us on Sunday, August the 28th, which I think is the fourth Sunday at our 1030 service. Our guest minister would be, oh, Reverend Kevin Vargas from the Philippine Missionary Baptist Church. And we are asking you to, to also, you know, in this celebration, it's not about just his anniversary. It's about, we want, he, we want you to share this anniversary with him. We, we are asking you for a, a donation, but even more than the donation, we want you to be here and to, to celebrate this great day with us. I am so proud of to be, to lead this up for the pastor as well as the pastor advisory team. Or oh, again, just join us on August the 28th, 2022 at 10.30. Thank you.
I ask that you pray along with me, okay? Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you for our opportunity to stand and spread your word, Father. First, God, first of all, God, we just thank you for salvation. Yes. Thank you for deliverance. Thank you for protection from the evil one. Yes. Father God, we ask that you feed us today. For you promised in your word that if we were hungry and thirst after righteousness, that you would fill us. Fill us up, Lord. Fill us up today, Lord, with your word. Take us, those who are stuck in what I would like to call a spiritual anorexia, Lord, I ask that you allow them to eat as well. Feed us today, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Yes. And we give your name, praise, and honor, and glory. Take your speaker today out of self, Lord. Make this vessel of dishonor honorable in your sight, Lord. Yes. Not to please men, for we know they are, they are fleeing. They love you today and hate you tomorrow. But I want to impress you, Lord, for you never change. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. Amen. 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 Now, for those of us who have our word with us today, our foundation scripture is found in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. And here at Gethsemane, we like to stand in honor of God's word. And you found that place. He can say amen. Yeah. So I know to go on. Matthew right. chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterwards and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taken him up into the holy city, and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And he said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angel charge concerning thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, he said, any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. Mm -hmm. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil take him up into an exceedingly high mountain, and show him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he said unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt follow God and worship me. And he said, and then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. All right. Amen. That is our word for today. Now in this portion of scripture, Jesus does something that is unique, but again, it isn't. It's simple. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, three years, was a living example to us Christians on how we should live and handle situations. Mm -hmm. When Jesus was faced with temptation, when Jesus was confronted with the enemy, what did he use to defeat the enemy? He used God's word. He used God's word. So, what do you think, Jesus being perfect, and if he had to use God's word, what do you think we need to do when we are tempted? Word. That's right. We need to use God's word. Amen? Amen? So we must, must get into his word. Unfortunately, many people uh, look at the Bible as we look at the Queen of England. Oh, she holds the proper, the highest position, but in reality, she doesn't have any power. A lot of us look at the Bible the same way. Oh, we hold it in a high position. We, we don't put it on the floor because it's holy. We set it on the highest shelf. We buy a nice little case to cut care with that goes with our offer. But in reality, in some of our lives, the Bible, the Bible holds no power. Unfortunately, many of us are this way because we just simply neglect the Bible. It's almost like this lady had this five-year-old daughter. She invited her minister over to dinner one day. 
And she wanted to impress not only the minister, but also her guests for how, quote unquote, spiritual she was. She wanted the minister to read a couple of verses after dinner. She tells the five-year-old daughter, daughter, go in and get the good book. And the daughter looked at the puzzle, good book. You know, daughter, the, the good book that we handle, the, the good book that we read out every day. The daughter was still kind of confused. The good book that we look at every day. The daughter said, oh, oh, I know, mom. So she runs into the other room and comes back with a book. She gives it to the minister, which is shocked. And the, the woman, which is in, the mother, which was in horror, because the daughter brought back the Sears and Roebuck's catalog. <laughs> <coughs> That's how some of us do our Bible. But if we were to really look at what the Bible is, perhaps we'll read it more often. So the question comes up, what exactly is the Bible? It is a love letter, a letter of love from the Creator. It is a love letter, a letter of love from the Creator. So if I was to give this talk of mine a little title, I would say that it would be called God's Love Letter or God's letter of love. When we think about love letters, we think about the wording of a love letter. When we think about a, a love letter, we think about the time that is placed in a love letter. We want to choose the right words. We want to use the right pronunciation. We want to do everything right because we want to effectively communicate to the person that's receiving this letter that we love her. Amen? Amen. Amen. Allow me, if you will, just to read to you two short love letters. And I want y'all to notice the passion. I want y'all to notice the wording of these love letters. This one is uh, an anniversary love letter, the first one. A relationship that's in uh, celebrating the anniversary. And it reads as follows. My darling, it was two years ago tonight that you first told me that you loved me and asked me to be your girlfriend. You changed my life that evening and put us on a path that has been, that has brought us so much joy. When I look at you today, I realize my love for you grows deeper, richer, and more satisfying as time goes by. Whenever something good happens, you're the first person I want to tell. When something bad happens, I know that I can count on you to take me in your arms and tell me everything will be all right. I'm the luckiest woman in the world because I can truly say that I'm in love with my best friend. There's not another man in the world that can hold a candle to you, my darling. I just wanted to let you know that I love you more than ever, than the most heartfelt words can express, with love from the one who adores you. Did y'all notice the passion? Did y'all notice the word selection? In case you didn't, let me read this other short one. This is a long distance love that I miss you, love. Dear heart, being apart from you is more difficult than I ever imagined. I see reminders of you everywhere I look. They make me ache to be near you again. I love you with all my heart. I cherish every moment we spend together. And I love you even more in the moments we are apart. Tonight I write this letter. It's like you are right here with me. I feel your hand on my shoulder, your fingers on my hair. A soft breath as you kiss my cheek. I miss you, darling. Come home. All my love. You're forever good. If you didn't take time to notice the passion, one thing is evident for sure is that they took their time to write this letter of love. So if man took their time, or a woman takes their time to write a letter of love, do you think God took his time when he wrote this letter of love? Yeah. Come on, come on. I say he did. I say he did. Why? Because it took 1,500 years. He did it on three different continents. He wrote part of it on African continent. He wrote part of it on the Asian continent. He wrote part of it on the European continent. He used 40 different authors. Some was kings. Some was slaves. Some was priests. Some was prophets. Some was fishermen. Some was a doctor. Some was a tax collector. All writing and using one central theme in this love letter. And it's he offered the way of deliverance through the blessed Son, Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. 
So if we will read this love letter and apply it to our lives, we could, we could make it through situations. Now, what I want to do to you right now, I want to just share our explanation, our exploration of this love letter. I want to bring up six brief points. First of all, the first part is the application of God's love letter. Then after that, we're going to talk about the authority of God's love letter. Then we're going to talk about the centrality of God's love letter. Then we're going to talk about the guidance of God's love letter, the provision of God's love letter, and the sufficiency of God's love letter. Can I proceed with your permission? Amen. Now, the application of God's love letter, the book of James, the first chapter, 23, 24 verse, supports this. It says, because if you, because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of person he was. What James is telling us in his letter is that we just can't hear the word of God. You just can't let somebody tell you the word of God. You must have apply the word of God to your life. Come on, come on. It's almost like these people that take these new kind of classes in college. I don't know if you ever heard of it. It's called editing a class. Have you ever heard of that? When you edit a class, you pay the money to go to the class. You're entitled to all the information of the class. You're entitled to all the literature that's passed out in the class. But you don't have to take any tests. You don't have to take any, uh, write any papers. You don't get no record of the class on the transcript. You don't get a diploma from the class. You just still getting the information. Unfortunately, a lot of people do that in church. They come to church, they edit the sermon. Come on, come on. Okay? Just like one of the classes. They don't want to take the test, which is applying the word to the life. As long as the people of God in their Christian life audit it, there is never will be a passing grade from God. There will never be a divine recognition from God, and there will never be no experience of your calling to God because you haven't committed. You haven't committed. So, if you don't read this letter of love, and if you don't apply this letter of love to your life, and if you don't become intimate with this letter of love, you have no power. First Corinthians 1 and 18 tells us this, that the preaching of the cross is foolishness. The preaching of the cross is stupid to throw people on the way to destruction. Yeah. But to us who are saved, and to us who are being saved, it is God's power. Yeah. This love letter is our power. When you came down that aisle, when you took that preacher's hand, when you gave your life to Christ, you didn't sign up for Sam Block Baseball, you signed up for the big leagues. We are fighting a spiritual battle. People in high places that are energized by the forces of darkness. And you go into a gunfight with a feather. We have got to know what we believe. We have got to know why we believe it. But you cannot do that until you get into this love letter and apply it to your life. Now, look at the application. What about the authority of this love letter? Is there any authority? Does this love letter have any authority? I say it does. And so does Peter. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 says this. Above all things, know this. That no prophecy or scripture comes from the prophet's own interpretation. Because prophecy, no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, man spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. In other words, every word in this Bible, God, the Holy Spirit, impressed on these writers. Yeah. Forty different writers wrote the same thing, but God allowed them to in interject their own individual personalities yeah. in the yeah. writing. Paul's writing is different from John. Yeah. John's writing is different from Peter. Yeah. But the theme is the same. Yeah. There is deliverance in this man called Jesus. He is the God that brings dead people back to life. 
if you just trust, rely, and depend on him. Amen. So, it's almost like, when we look at the authority of God, I love that. It's almost like this, this captain that was the head captain in this Pacific fleet. One night he's sailing in the Pacific, and he sees a light coming to him in the distance. It's on a collision course. That captain gets on a bullhorn and says, we need you to move 10 degrees to the north, because if you do not, we're going to crash. The voice came back from the light. No, you need to move 10 degrees to the south. I'm not going to move. If you don't move, you're going to crash. The captain answered back as the light get closer and closer. Don't you know I am the head captain of this fleet? I ordered you to move 10 degrees to the north. Or we're going to crash. The voice came back and said, I will not. You might be the captain, but I am the lighthouse. <laughs> you see, God's love letter is that lighthouse. Yeah. God's love letter is our foundation. It is our guideline. It is our harbor of safety. It is our stability and assurance. It is a solid foundation. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, anybody that does my word and follows my commandments, I look at that person as a wise man that builds his house upon a foundation of rock. Yeah. So when the wind and the rain beat upon it, the house stood. But he said, anybody that does not do my commandments, does not uh, do my will, I like him like a foolish man that builds his house on sand. And when the wind comes and the rain beat upon the house, how great was that fall? Because yeah. he had no foundation. You have got to build yourself upon this love letter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is this centrality? What is the centrality of God's love letter? What is the central theme of God's love letter? Amen. Preach. Help me preach this. Sure. Romans 1, 16 to 17 gives us a good clue of what it is. This is Paul writing to the Romans. I am not ashamed of the gospel mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. because it is power, it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Greeks. For it, in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. When we deal with the centrality of God's love letter, the gospel is the core of God's love letter. Mm -hmm. What is the gospel? The gospel is that this man named Jesus lived according to the scripture. The gospel is this man Jesus died according to the scripture. The gospel is that he rose three days later according to the scripture. And that he's coming back again for us yeah. according to the scripture. Yeah. Yeah. See, the, the gospel is this, that whosoever believeth in him will have everlasting life. Yeah. But there's another part of the gospel. Whosoever does not believe in him does not have life. But God's wrath is still on that person. Yeah. The centrality of this love letter is that this Jesus has rescued us from the wrath to come. Amen. So if somebody ever asks you, well, what are you saved from? You know, I mean, some people get through shouting, saying I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, what are you saved from? They have nothing to say. You're saved from God's coming wrath. Yeah. Right now, we're living in a time, uh, if we was in the time of Noah, Noah would be building this ark right now in preparation for his wrath. Well, when you come to Christ, you're in the, the ark of safety. You're saved from the wrath to come. That's what you're saved from. That's what you're saved from. You know, the core of the gospel, I, 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 I'm sorry, I just got to go and help me out. The core of the gospel, which is the gospel, the core of the, uh, of the God's love letter, which is the gospel, is this. It's almost like it's almost like the football in the game of football. You can have the right uniform on, you can have the right helmet, you can have the right cleats, the right field, the right stadium. But if you don't have the football, you can't play the game. You can't play the game. You cannot play the game without the football. Now what does that mean? The football determines touchdowns. The football determines field goals. The football determines first downs. The football is determined uh, when you catch the ball, the control of the football determines whether you caught it or not. The football is everything to the game. 
Without the football, you, you just wasting a Saturday or Sunday. Right? Without that pit scheme. Well, the Christian faith is the same way. You can go to the same church. You can carry the same right Bible. You can do the right Christian shop talk. You can have all the accessories of Christianity and still not have the main thing. If you do not have the main thing, everything else is a waste of time. You can't, just like you can't play football without the football, you can't have an effective Christian life without the gospel. But you don't know about the gospel if you don't ever read the love letter. It's in here. Is there guidance in this love letter? Yeah. I say there is. It is. Proverbs 6 22 says the same thing. It says, when you walk here and there, they will guide you. When you lie down, they will watch over you. When you wake up, they will talk to you. What he is saying in the scripture is that when you get the wisdom in this word of God, it's there with you all the time. All the time. When you go to bed, it's with you. When you walk here and there, it's with you. When you rise up, it's with you. It will talk to you. His wisdom. His wisdom and his love now. It's like, I'm sorry, it's like being a car on the freeway. You got a designated lane that you drive in. If you drift to the right, you may cause an accident. If you drift to the left, you might cause an accident. But there's appropriate time for you to change your lanes. Yeah. When it's clear. When it's clear, right, D? Gospel gives us a lane to stand as well. This love book gives us a lane to stand as well. The Holy Spirit and his guidance gives you that lane to stand as well. Based on the written word of God and the affirmation of the Holy Spirit, you stay in the lane that the Holy Spirit puts you in until, and your ways will always be appropriate, will be prosperous. We have to listen to the guidance that he offers us in his love letter. Amen. Amen. The provision that this love letter provides is this. Genesis, the ninth chapter, third verse tells us, every creature that lives and moves will be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything for food. Also, Philippians 4.19 reinforced that. All God and God and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Whatever you need is in this book. Any provision you need is in this book. But sadly, one of the most common sins that Christians commit today is what? Worry. Amen. Worry. The Bible tells us that when we worry, we are literally telling the God who says he is faithful, a God who cannot lie, that you're not capable of doing what you said you could do. I can do it myself. What he tells us, by you worrying, can you add one minute? Can you add one second? Can you add one hour, one day, one month to your life? If you can't do these simple things, why worry about something you have no control over? Let us be faithful in the provision that he offers us in this love letter. It's also, I know these stories just something that come to me. It's also like this man that went to prison. Well, somebody Mr. to me he had a couple of months to stay in prison. He, he calls his mother on the phone and said, Mom, I need $500 to take care of some of these fines. Mother said, did you pray? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Mom, I prayed. Did you read your Bible? Well, I, I, yeah, I read. So he calls a couple of months later when she didn't give him the money. He called again a couple of weeks later. Excuse me, said, Mom, I, I need that five, $500. She said, did you, did you pray some? Yeah, yeah, I prayed. Did you read the Bible I sent you? Yeah, yeah, I read that Bible, yeah. So he hung up the phone mad. When it was time for him to be released, guess who picked him up? His mother. She gets in the car with her attitude. So, Mama, when I needed you, you wasn't there. She said, did you pray? Yeah, I told you I prayed. Did you read the Bible? Yeah, yeah, I read the Bible. She said, son, give me your Bible. She gave her the Bible. She went to all of her favorite scriptures in the Bible, and on each favorite scripture of hers was uh, money that was uh, paper clip to each one of those scriptures. 
The problem is this. Because he did not take the Bible seriously, he could not get what the Bible offered. When you don't take this love letter seriously, you cannot profit from what it offers. I'm not going to this church because I didn't get fed. You didn't get fed because you didn't read the love letter. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Come on here. Now as I approach my, my final point, is this Bible or this letter of love from God, is it sufficient? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. Is it sufficient? Proverbs 30, verse 5 to 6. This blew my mind. Every word of God is tested and refined like silver. He is a shield to those who trust and take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will prove you yeah. and will make you be found alive. I just want to dwell on that word test for a minute. Every word that God has placed in his Bible, he tested before he allowed those men to write. Every word he tested, every word he probed, every word he inquired, every word he examined, every word he inspected, every word he authenticated, every word he determined, every word he screened, every word he refined, Every word he verified, every word he validated, every word he evaluated, every word he explored, every word in this love letter was placed there just like those people wrote that love letter I read to you in the beginning. He took his time so that we may be edified by the message in this love letter. But you got to read it. You got to apply it to your life. It's almost like Y'all ever seen that commercial back in the day? I'm telling my age right now. <laughs> that Pringle commercial where the little boy comes to the room and kitchen and smells this good Pringle stuff. I said, Mom, smell like tomato sauce. Is tomatoes, a, you got tomato? She said, it's in there. <laughs> well, I, what about garlic? She said, it's in there. What about, what about a, a onion? She said, it's in there. But what about sausages? She said, it's in there. Everything is in that Prego sauce to give it its texture, to give it its flavor, to give it its aroma. Everything you need for that Prego sauce is in there. Well, the Bible is just the same way. Just love that. If you want joy, it's in there. If you want peace, it's in there. If you want happiness, it's in there. If you need correction, it's in there. If you need peace, Love is in there. What about victory? It's in there. If you need transformation, it's in there. If you need deliverance, it's in there. If you need a brand new you, it's in there. The divine nature has given you everything you need and you can learn about what is available by studying and applying his word. God holds each and every one of us accountable. I can understand. In, in, those, in the defense of those who don't want to study, I understand. Because something I read in college blew my mind. It had a big post at the bookstore that says, why study? Why study? And the college students really want to see that. Because the more you study, the more you learn. The more you learn, the more you're able to forget. The more you forget, the less you know. So why study? Fortunately, a lot of people look at this love there the same way. Now, as I hasten to my conclusion, I just like to, as if God is appealing one last time to you about this love letter. I would like to just touch on it one last time. And from his love letter, he says this, who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow before them like a young tender plant, like a root out of a dry and stale ground. He has no form. He has no kindness. And when we look at him, there's nothing beautiful about him that we should even desire him. He is despised. He is rejected of man. He is a man of sorrow. He is acquainted with grief. And we hid as if it was our faces from him. He was despised. And we showed him what we said. Surely he has borne our grief. 
and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him smitten, stricken of God and disease. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment was, that was necessary that brought us peace with God was placed upon him and by his stripes and by the whip lashes. Oh, will we heal? I, I know, I know all of we, all of we, like sheep have gone straight. Every one of us has turned and went our own way. But the Lord has placed upon him the sins of us all. Yeah. He was despised. He was rejected. Then he opened up not his mouth. Like a lamb is silent before the slaughter, and like the sheep is silent before those that shear her, he did not open his mouth. He was taken from prison and judgment. And who shall declare his children? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased God to crush him and cause him to suffer. Yet when his soul is made an offering for our sins, he shall see his children. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul. He shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servants justify many, and he shall be, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he, have, and he was numbered with the transgressions. And he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgression. Yeah. Folks, that is a love letter. Folks, this is a letter of love. He has offered us his gift today. He has offered us the chance today. Today, do not harden your heart if you don't know the Lord as your Savior. Today is the day of salvation. And salvation is just a fancy word for deliverance. If you do not know the Lord today, the doors of the church are open right now. And all that took me in is that she came to my door. She came to my door, and we were taking out of the plan of salvation. Take the deepest hand, and we'll, we'll help you. But if you want to come on your Christian experience, you're already saved, and you just want to be a part of something, we ask that you come forward. We'll have to make you there as well. We don't ask that you come to the church, but we ask that you go to a church that teaches the Bible. And if you just don't know, and you just want some questions answered, we ask that you come forward today. We ask you to come forward today. Is there one? Jesus loves me.
saying thank you. Thanking you for allowing us to hear a word from on high. Well, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless this communion, which is representing your body and your blood. Father God, we thank you for what we have heard, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, and it reads as follows. For I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it, and said, This is my body, which is which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Excuse me, you all, I have a bad eye, so just bear with me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you, you, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he said to them, take this wine represents the blood that shall be shared for you. And remember, do this in remembrance with me every time you come together. With that, let us drink.
glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and evermore. Let the church. Thank you.